Hello, and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. You know, I write now all of the music that I use for this show. Years ago, I didn't think I'd be able to write music. I just never thought of myself as a composer, and I'm not, strictly speaking, a fine composer. But then, as you go along and you learn more and more, melodies come to your mind, and you want to write them down. What if you want to compose music on your own? How do you get started doing it? Well, I'm going to just give you some little extra exercises now so that you can get started doing it and it won't take much time on your part that is if you're interested in creating your own music now I want to answer the question why do people even write music at all there's a lot of music out there a lot of it is in public domain so you don't have to worry about copyright rules but the thing is you are always worried about breaking somebody's copyright rules and always worried about getting into trouble because you're you are using some somebody else's material. And the, the copyright rules are very, very strict. They're so strict that I think sometimes they're a little bit on the ridiculous side. I think that if you want to use somebody's music, as long as you're giving credit to the composer, or if you're going to be writing a book, as long as you're giving credit to the person who wrote the book or wrote the quote, then you should be able to do it, and to, at least to a reasonable degree. But the things are so strict that you can get into trouble, and I think one reason that people write music Music is so that they won't run afoul of copyright laws and they won't have to fight for permission to use everybody's music. Now when I wrote a book, I had a book published and it was on visual illusions and perception, something that I do and something that I've done research on and I enjoy doing it and I wrote a book on it. I got permission from a person to do their artwork. Their, their illusions. Then they had permission uh, to give that they gave to other people to use their artwork. So I had to contact the people who had already contacted them, and I sometimes had to write about 20 letters or so asking for permission to use a person's work. The originator and all the people he gave, he gave permission, you had to get permission from all of them because all of their works were also under copyright law. <laughs> so it gets to be so strict, you wonder how anyone's music can be played in public because you've got to check with them and you've got to check and, and they have to give you permission and if they don't you can't use the music. Well what about the music that was written years ago? From my understanding the melody lines are, are for public consumption, they're in public domain below the year of 1923. I think that's the way it is. So if I wanted to use a piece of music that was written before 1923, that should be an option for me to do it. But the problem is other people have used that music and they've put their own orchestrations to it and therefore you have to get permission because their orchestrations of that music are under copyright law. So therefore, you don't have any options. If you're, not, if you're gonna use a, a, a melody law, Line, you have to provide your own orchestration for it. The melody lines may be in public domain, but the way that the, the, that the uh, uh, music industry is, the orchestrations that various people have put to it are under copyright law. And as a result of that, you have a really nasty mess on your hands. I've heard of people who made a set design for a television show and they used a portrait of somebody and they put it on the wall. It was just a prop, and they got sued for it because they didn't get permission to use that, that uh, prop in their show. And it was just a picture hung on a wall. The most ridiculous thing I've heard is now a man got sued. He went to a zoo, and uh, there was a monkey in the zoo, and the monkey was playing with a camera, and he took a selfie accidentally, of course, and he had a beautiful picture of his face, beautiful expression on his face. So somebody decided to use that in their show from the zoo. Then he got sued because he didn't get permission to have the picture used in his show, even though it was taken by a monkey. So now the case is in court. Who owns the copyright if the monkey took the picture? A monkey can't hold a copyright. He didn't even know he took his picture. He was just playing with the camera. 
And so it gets to be very, very, very complicated. So I think that's one of the reasons that people decide to write their own music. If they write their own music, then they're not, they're not infringing on anybody else's music unless the music that they write is too similar to the music that's already been written. Well, how would you know that? When I write music, a lot of times a song comes to me, and it comes to me all at once. I have the whole song. When some people compose, they have to write, and then they have to add notes here, and they have to add notes there, and they have to add the bridge, and they have to add the refrain, and everything has to be added. With me, I get the whole song, the whole song at once, bridge and all, and I write it down, so I have it. So how would I know whether it really is created by my own mind, which is what I think, or could I be remembering somebody's song that was written umpteen years ago that I just happened to hear a few times, and for some reason I'm remembering it now? I don't know if you can ever answer that question, but at any rate, if you want to write music, if you're going to do performances, if you're going to do solos, unless you have permission or some kind of a copyright uh, exclusion so you can do it, and there are those things you can do, you can do, get that for a few thousand dollars a year, I guess. But once you, get, uh, once you get so you're performing, do you want to write your own music? If you want to write your own music, then you can get started on that. Now, I write for students. My music is to be uplifting and to teach certain things. And if I want to teach something, then I can write a song to be able to teach it. I can write a song for the purpose of teaching whatever it is I want to teach. I build the song around the concept. So if I want to do something on octaves, I, instead of saying, OK, this is how you play your octaves, And that those are all octaves. Why not write a song on octaves? You know? <laughs> well, I'm kind of composing it in my head as I'm doing it. So that's kind of a song. It needs some, it needs some adjusting, but it, it just came out of my head. What did I do? I wanted to show how to play an octave, and I started on the D. better version of it. Now, I just created this on the spot. I didn't write it early. It just came to me now. If I wanted to uh, do a show on four, or four, let's say six, six. <laughs> so this is a six. Now, remember, we've been working on intervals for music, intervals between the notes. So a six is this.
So I just did that. Now, the way that I did that, and I haven't prepared this, it's just coming out of my head. And so it's not as good and finished as it would be, because if I were to write this down, which I would have to, or I'd lose it. If I were to write this down, I have to, I have to finish it off, you know, make some changes here and there. But basically, the song is there. So you can make up a lot of songs. And one of the reasons I'm spending all this time on the intervals between the notes is that's how I do it. Now, other people do it differently. It's hard to teach composing because some people can do it, some people have a gift for it, and some people don't. But there are little things that I've developed, kind of like tricks of the trade, you might say, I do the intervals. I'm just doing uh, dotted eighths and sixteenths, but you can take the intervals one and two. Uh, let me just go over them. One step. That would be a third. A fourth. A fifth. That's the sixth. Very hard to do something on the seventh because it's not quite an octave and they, they, they clash. You know, the vibrations are such that they clash. that song up out of arpeggios. An arpeggio is when you play notes of a chord, but you have to play them separately because you can't play them together on an instrument like this. You could only play one note at a time. If you had a guitar or a violin or a piano, any kind of a keyboard, you would be able to play chords. You, you play them all at the same time. When you have to play them separately because you can only play one note at a time, then you have an arpeggio. Once you, get the, the, once you get the intervals in your mind, uh, you can use them. You can use them in songwriting, and that's what I do. I've been to classes where they teach you songwriting and how to do it and all of that, but we never used intervals. This is just something that I've created on my own, but it does seem to help me at least. It helps me to focus, to get a melody. Now, it's not going to be great art. You know, It's not going to be Dave, Debussy or Chopin, but it's going to be something that's uplifting, and it's going to be an actual song, and it's going to be a song that you can learn and you can play harmonies to and a song that you can remember and it's also going to be a song that's going to teach you whatever I want you to know or whatever you're trying to teach somebody else if you're the one doing the teaching. If you want to do eighths, uh, dotted eighths and sixteenths, remember dotted eighths and sixteenths are one beat e each. So. made that up. Um, well, I've, I've been making all of this up. 
So that's why you need to know what the intervals are. Now, if you're just playing music and you're not interested in composing, then uh, knowing what the intervals are will help you to remember the music. Or if you hear a melody and you want to save it, because if you don't write it down, you probably won't be able to remember it. And so you write it down. And you can use the intervals to help you to write music, just to, for music that's familiar, not even for composing. If you're a singer, you need to know the intervals because of the fact that you may be looking at a piece of music and you may not have anybody uh, working with you. You may not have anybody behind you uh, playing an instrument to use as a background music. So you have to look and see what, what, uh, what the interval is. Does it jump a fourth? Does it go down by two? And that way, knowing the timing and what the intervals are, you're able to figure out what the melody of what it is that you're trying to sing. Normally you would have background music or you'd be singing with an orchestra playing or in your, in your mind you know what it is. So I would suggest if you want to start composing, uh, that you get staff paper and uh, make sure you have some on hand. I've used envelopes and everything just drawing out staff paper if I've thought of a melody and I want to write it down. But take a, a piece, a simple piece that you're really familiar with. You know, Jingle Bells, Mary Had a Little Lamb, Row, Row, Row Your Boat, and start playing it by ear on an instrument. And then write those notes down on the staff paper. So if I play, um, row, row, row your boat, I started out with a G. One, two, three, and four. See, I, this will be four, four time. In your brain, you can figure out, is this going to be a waltz? Is this is going to be four, four time, which is usual, or any other time signature? So I'm saying one, two, three, and four. And so I start out with just those notes. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take my pen and I'm going to write it down. I won't do it here, but this just to show you, I'd start off at the top. And I can't, uh, this isn't working too well. One, two, three, and this will be a dotted eighth and sixteenth, and this will be the fourth note. One, two, three, four, four beats to a measure. And you just write it down. Then when you go to look at it, to play it again, you've got the notes. All you have to do is play what you've written. So it's not that hard of a deal once you get started. It is very time consuming. But I think that if you really want to compose, it may be the way to start you off composing because you can write down what it is that you're playing. Now, if you don't have an instrument with you and you're listening to the radio and you're in your car and you don't have an instrument with you, who carries instruments when they travel? Uh, it, it's, uh, you can just kind of think in your mind, I think this would start on a G. One, two, three, and four. And you can figure out what the fingerings would be if you had your instrument with you, and then you write it down. You might get it right, you might get it wrong. But the thing is, you've got to start. Now, a lot of times when I've been either listening to something or listening to a record or a uh, watching a DVD, I see something, I hear something, and I really like it, and I want to preserve it. Not so much that I can use it, because I don't want to break anybody else's copyright laws, but just so that I can remember it, because I like it. So I'll sit with staff paper, and I'll write down what I think the notes are. Now, I might get it in a different key, but if I get the sequence of the notes right, and so, and the timing right, that I might end up by writing it in a different key, but so what if I do write it in a different key? I still will have it. And by looking at it and looking at the timing, as long as the timing is right and I don't get messed up with that, I will remember the song. If a song comes to your mind, but you don't, haven't heard it before as far as you know, and you'd like to save it because you think it's a composition that you kind of your mind is working on, write it down because it will not stay with you. Once you lose it, you can't get it back. It's an odd thing. If you think um, of when you're dreaming, 
you wake up and you have this very powerful, potent dream, and you think you'll always remember it. So you go about your business, 10 minutes later, you've lost it. You don't know what the dream was. You might remember some elements, but you may not remember it at all. The only thing remem you remember was that you woke up and you had a dream and you wanted to remember it. In that case, the only way to remember it is, wake, is write it down, when you still have it, because once it's gone, and it can go quickly, you can dream something and it can be gone in four seconds or less. It just goes out of your mind and goes back into the subconscious. Well, music is kind of the same way. Poetry is kind of the same way. If you don't write it down when you've got it, and if it's music, it'll stay with you for a while, so you have time to write it down if you stop everything and do it. But if you don't, you get busy with doing things in a half an hour, oh, what was that song I thought of? And you can't get it back. It's in the subconscious somewhere, and you can't get it back. So my suggestion, if you're going to write music, is to go ahead, get your staff paper. You can always, you can always uh, photocopy it to get more copies. When I start teaching students, I always give them some staff paper. I get, make a little notebook for them with the things I want them to know and the things I hope they'll learn. And I always add some staff paper to that. And they can always get it photocopied. It's not under, staff paper, as far as I know, is not copyrighted, at least mine is, and I don't care who uses it. So, and then, and then they can write down what they're thinking. There is an interesting story about a woman who wrote a very beautiful song. I heard it on the radio. It was so beautiful, I wished I'd had a copy of it, but I didn't. And she said when she wrote it, all of a sudden the song came to her. It was like coming to her from everywhere. It was coming to her from the walls, from the ceiling. It was very potent, very, uh, very uh, uh, unusual song, beautiful song, and it was just on her all the time. And she wrote it down and that's how she saved it and then she made arrangements to it you can take a song you know make your own arrangement to it if it's a song that's in public domain you run a risk if it's not in public domain of breaking copyright law I wish the copyright law was a little different but I really think a lot of people write music one for the reason that it's a, a, an expressive thing but the other reason they write music is so that it's theirs, and they don't have to worry about contacting everybody under the sun to be able to use it. When I wrote my book, I wrote to the originator of the artwork to get permission, and usually they gave it to me, but sometimes they didn't. But then I also had to write to everybody else who had also used it, because it was under copyright law for them as well. I might have to write 20 pieces of paper asking for permission for one drawing. Well, I fixed that. I just started doing my own drawings, you know, and I had people writing me for permission to use my drawings. I'm no artist, but I did it, and I did a whole book on it, and it worked out fine for me. So at any rate, this is just the beginning of a series that I want to do on composition, occasionally, not all the time, for people who want to write music. And if you don't want to write music, then it's good for you to listen and watch anyway, because you'll get some hints as to how to remember music that you want to remember and how to approach music if you ever decide that you want to write music. And you're not aiming, or I'm not aiming to have you be, you know, like uh, writing operettas and, and uh, a lot of, of music that's complex, just to write melodies that come to you, melodies that are important to you. So I'm going to close it here, and we'll do something else next time. Please join me then.